Welcome everybody. My name is Marty Mascari. I'm with the North Central Texas Area Agency on Aging and the North Central Texas Aging and Disability Resource Center or ADRC, both of which are under the um, umbrella of the North Central Texas Council of Governments in the greater Dallas-Fort Worth, Texas area. Um, we are blessed once again to have our partners at Heyman Hogue here uh, today to talk about special needs trusts, who needs one and, and how they work. And before we do that, we're going to touch on the CEUs for people that are joining us for um, for professional CEUs. And I'll let Sheila do that. If we could advance the slide one, that would be great. Good morning again, everyone. Um, we are happy at Heyman Hogue to give you a uh, continuing education because it's so important because so many of you work with those who, uh, you know, they need expert care. And this way it helps you to educate them. And that's wonderful. Um, here's how all you have to do. You watch the video or the uh, presentation today. Then uh, in a follow-up email, Marty is going to send you a couple of things. He's going to send you a, an eval form and a sign-in sheet. Okay, if you would fill those out and please send those back to me, Sheila at Heyman Hogue, then I will send you your certificate. Very simple. We're very, very happy to have you today. And please know that we value each and every one of you for what you do to help others. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much, Sheila. We certainly appreciate you guys doing the CEUs as well. That's 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 no little task, let me tell you. Um, so um, especially when we're talking you know, 150 people joining us, it's, it's quite a cumbersome task. So um, thank you, thank you. Um, in addition to um, to uh, Shirley's, uh, uh, Sheila's two documents, um, we're gonna have a Google survey. It should give you the opportunity to, to go to that as you close out of Zoom today. If not, there'll be a link to that as well on the follow-up email that I send out. And um, if you could complete that, that helps us in uh, collecting the information to report back on the goals and objectives we set forth when we um, when we applied for the funding to put on uh, these webinars. And so if you could uh, complete that as well, that would be very, very helpful. Um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me, Sheila, I'm gonna let you introduce Austin if you would, and we'll get rolling. Austin, otherwise known as Rockstar here at the firm, because he is, he has jumped in and, uh, you know, he's been with us a little over a year, year and a half, I think, maybe, uh, probably, yeah. but he has had, he has almost seven years of uh, a, an experience being an attorney, so he's not new to the legal field, he was just, we were just lucky to get him. Um, but the reason I want to bring him his attention to you is because Austin, you know, special needs is a special part of the law that you really need to have a heart for um, because it is different and you're dealing with a lot of different circumstances here. And I have seen him in action as he's spoken to groups and been uh, educating other people, and he definitely does have a heart for it. So he has a young daughter, and he has a baby son on the way. So please welcome, without further ado, rock star Austin Butts. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about special needs trusts, uh, who, need, who needs them, and, and how they operate. Um, I want to set your expectations uh, here at the beginning. I want you to be prepared to learn um, the three different ways you can plan your estate. Um, I'm going to essentially be giving estate planning 101. Uh, and if you've heard me speak before or other attorneys from our firm speak, you've heard uh, a lot of that subject. Uh, but I have to cover this uh, just in case there are new people that haven't watched these seminars. Uh, because they're pretty foundational concepts before we can get into uh, the special needs trust. Uh, and then we'll get into the details of what a special needs trust is, how it works, and, and who needs one. So in general, uh, there are three different ways you can plan your estate. Uh, the first way you can plan your estate is to do nothing. 70% uh, of Americans choose this option. And I, I, I hear 
lots of different reasons. I hear people say uh, that they're too busy, they don't want to make the time to, to plan their estate, uh, or it's it's too expensive, or they, they are a little superstitious and think if they put their estate plan in place, they're, they're immediately going to pass away, get hit by a bus as they leave the attorney's office. And I can tell you that fear is unfounded. I, I have not uh, experienced that in my career. Um, now, this, this is a reason for concern, because if 70% of Americans don't have a will, they don't know how their assets will be distributed after pass away. There is a plan for that to happen, uh, but they don't know what that plan looks like. Uh, they don't know who will serve as a guardian for minor children. Um, they don't know who will make their health care decisions for them if they're not able to do it. Now, there's a lot of information on the slide. I want to unpack this for you. In Texas, you pass away and you don't have a will, don't have a trust, you, you haven't taken any steps to plan your estate, the government has planned your estate for you. Uh, there are set rules for how your assets pass. Uh, and so on the right-hand side of the slide, uh, this is an excerpt from a, a, a presentation that uh, Travis County Probate Court uh, has put out to give you a visual demonstration of how the assets pass. And I find it very helpful to use when talking uh, to people about uh, how an intestate succession works in Texas when we pass away in the Valley Bill. Uh, so if you, you are married and you and your spouse have joint children and you pass away, the community property you have goes to your spouse. Uh, Texas is a community property state. Uh, so the things that you acquire during your marriage, the presumption is they're going to be community property. Uh, and any income you earn during your marriage is community property. Separate property would be assets you owned before marriage or you received as a gift or an inheritance. Uh, and if you're married and you've got, got joint children, your separate personal property doesn't all go to your spouse. Uh, so if you inherited some money and you put it in a bank account, uh, that two thirds of that money is going to the children, not to the surviving spouse. And that's a surprise for a lot of people. Uh, separate property real estate is even more of like a surprise. So if you inherit uh, your parents' house uh, and then you pass away, that that house goes to your children, not to your surviving spouse. And it's contrary to what most people would want. Um, if, if you ask them how you wanted their assets to pass, they would want to do it differently. Uh, and this is this is even more drastic when we have a blended family that we're talking about. So say you have children from a prior relationship, uh, and you pass away, your share of the community property does not go to the surviving spouse. So if you co-own a house and you pass away, your 50% ownership of that house goes to the children and not to the surviving spouse. Uh, and I've had a lot of unfortunate conversations with surviving spouses that are, are being informed for the first time that they now co-own their house with their spouse's kids. Um, and it, it can create very difficult circumstances. Uh, and this can also be disastrous for uh, children that have special needs. There's special planning that you want to put in place uh, to avoid your special needs beneficiaries from being disqualified for benefits. And I'm going to unpack that later in this presentation. So the second option, uh, if, if you want to do something, uh, dictate how you want things done, um, a lot of people, well, most everybody knows you need at least a will. So option two is to have a will in place. But there's a major misconception about having a will. Um, all wills must be probated. A will does not avoid probate. A will is a set of instructions for how to get through probate. Uh, and, and a lot of people don't realize that. Um, and so go, the probate process is where we file an application with the court and we have to prove to the judge that the will is a valid will uh, and, and that the executor uh, should be authorized to act. The executor can't do anything until a judge signs in court. It's not an automatic document. Uh, and there, there are a lot of problems that can arise with probate. One, uh, it's expensive. Uh, it's ex uh, in Texas, you have to be represented by an attorney. Uh, 
Uh, so that attorney has their fees, the court has fees, uh, and no, no honest attorney will be able to tell you that they can 100% guarantee what your costs are going to be, because there's a lot of different things that can happen on probate that can make it longer than normal. Uh, delays, delays are, are a huge issue with using a war. Because uh, if you don't have authority to act until the will is probated, and we can't get into the probate court for a couple of months, you, know, you don't have access to the funds. Uh, probate is a public process. Everything that's in the court file is available to the public. Uh, and if you use a will-based plan, that can create a need for a court or a guardianship if you become incapacitated. Uh, delays in probate uh, have always been there, uh, and in my experience, I guess I'm coming up on nine years uh, of practice, uh, probate has always had delays uh, because the courts get backed up. They've got a lot of cases, a lot of people pass away, and so a lot of people need to do probate. Uh, and before COVID, you'd be looking at six months to two years uh, to get through the probate process. Uh, COVID backed up a lot of the courts. Uh, some of the courts uh, have, have gotten back to what they were pre-pandemic, uh, but some of them are still trying to catch up from the volume uh, of, of new COVID cases that are being filed. Um, and so if, if you need access and authority to deal with a deceased person's assets, going through probate significantly delays when you're able to do that. Uh, and so when, when you file, when you go through the probate process, uh, we prepare an application, we file it with the court, and it's a lot of hurry up and wait. Uh, we have to wait for the court to publish notice. Uh, that has to go for 10 days before we can do anything. Uh, and then we can request a hearing. Uh, and in some counties, you can get it as quickly as a month to two out. Uh, in other counties, you're looking at six to eight months before you can even get in front of the judge. Uh, and then there are complications that can arise if if uh, there's a family dynamic where not everybody is on the best terms, that significantly slows down the probate process and, and back and forth and signing documents and consenting to how people serve uh, it can create a lot of delays and complications. Probate is public. Uh, so if you pass away, your will gets probated um, and you owe any money at all, uh, we have to file an inventory of your assets. Uh, and so that inventory is intended so your creditors can see what's available to pay those debts. Anybody that wants to see that inventory can, so they can see all of your finances on public display. Your nosy neighbor, uh, predators that are out there, they can all see that. Uh, and with it being a public process, it's a much easier uh, venue for contests uh, and issues uh, with the beneficiaries. Identity theft is also a major threat. There's a lot of sen sensitive information that goes in the probate process that is not redacted. So the options of planning your states, you do nothing, which who knows is not a good option. Uh, you can do a will-based plan, and that's better than doing nothing. You can at least say how you want things done, but there are some significant uh, downsides to using a will-based plan. Uh, there's a better solution, and that's using a revocable living trust. Uh, the analogy I like to use to explain how a trust works uh, is it's like a secure warehouse. You store your assets inside this warehouse. You and your spouse, or if you're mere, if you're single, uh, just you have keys to get into this warehouse. You can access the assets inside, you can use them however you'd like, you can take them out, you can put them back in, but you have complete control. But in the event you pass away or become incapacitated, there is no court involvement. Your spouse has access to the, the keys, they can get in and access the assets, uh, or if you're single, the next person you put in line, they automatically get a key. Uh, it's an instant process 
uh, for them to get in and access your assets and, and do what you want them to do with it. Um, so inside this warehouse, there are detailed instructions uh, for how to manage and distribute those assets. So at a at a thirty thousand foot view, uh, a revocable living trust is nine times out of ten going to be the best option for people to plan their estates. Uh, they, they, they are, they are very commonly used these days. They're not just for the super wealthy, the Mark Cubans of the world. Um, there are very common documents so that things can stay out of the court to cost down, move things along quickly and easily. So now that I've, I've done a very high level look at estate planning 101, let's shift gears and talk about what you're all here to learn about today, and that's that special needs trusts. Um, uh, some people call them supplemental needs trusts. Both are, are, are descriptive of, of what uh, this trust does. Uh, so this is a special type of trust that's intended to preserve government benefits for your beneficiary that has special needs. Uh, it has the benefit uh, of being automatic in most cases. There, there are different ways you can set it up. You can do a special needs trust within a will. Most attorneys, when they prepare a will for somebody, they'll have some very general language. Uh, it says if somebody is incapacitated, it needs to be managed for them. Um, it, it, it does not give very good instructions for who's going to carry that out. Uh, it's better to set up a, uh, a revocable living trust that goes into effect while you're alive. Uh, and you can have the supplemental needs trust as part of your main living trust, or you can have it as a standalone, depending on the circumstances. There, there are good reasons to go either way or like that. Uh, and then there are other options that could be uh, created after you pass away and get to that in a minute. Uh, but you're, in setting up a special needs trust, you're trying to make the inheritance you are leaving your beneficiary last as long as possible. Uh, because if, if they are receiving government assistance uh, and we give them an inheritance, it can disqualify them from uh, their benefits. They have to spin down what you left them. Um, and in this trust, you can provide a detailed framework for how you want the assets to be managed and spent to take care of, of your disabled beneficiary. Uh, and in there, you can express uh, your, your desires to take care of your child. Uh, whenever I prepare special needs trusts, I'll, I'll put language in to talk about uh, how the, the parent wants the child to live as independently as possible. Uh, and have self-determination, be able to make their own decisions uh, with the help of, of, of the team that we're putting in place with the Special Needs Trust. Uh, and and it, it provides a way for the parents to impart how they want their child cared for should something happen to them. Um, and a Special Needs Trust, if designed correctly, can protect the assets from predators and predators. So let's talk about government assistance. Uh, with a, a child that has special needs uh, will frequently receive uh, supplemental security income or SSI uh, and Medicaid in order to help cover their expenses. Now, in order to receive both of those, uh, a dis disabled adult child can't have more than $2,000 in countable resources. Well, what's countable resource? Uh, there, there's a short list of assets that are not considered tenable resources. Uh, so if, if a disabled person owns their own home, that doesn't count against them. Uh, if they have a car, if they've got personal belongings, uh, a, a burial contract, there's a, there's a very short list of things they can have, and it's not going to count against them. Generally, everything outside of that short list is considered a countable resource. Money in a bank account is a countable resource. Um, and so if they have more than $2,000 in their account at the end of the month, they are in jeopardy of losing their assistance. There's also an income prong to this. They can't earn more than $914 per month and stay eligible for these benefits. So if, if a parent passes away and leaves them even a modest inheritance, 
that's going to present issues with this government assistance. If they are, if the child is relying upon Medicaid for their for their health care costs, so the, the the SSI to to help pay for uh, their apartment they're living in. If 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 you disqualify them from those benefits, they have to spend down the inheritance uh, until it's all gone, and then once it's spent down, then they reapply for those benefits and. That's not always an overnight process, I and mean, it can be a very dangerous situation depending on the services that, that they are receiving. So there's a couple of different types of special needs trusts that are intended to avoid that problem. Uh, the first is what's called a self-settled supplemental needs trust or a first party supplemental needs trust. Uh, those typically come up when pre-planning was not done. Uh, if we have a, a child that receives an inheritance uh, and their parents didn't do any kind of special needs trust planning, then the child can set up their own special needs trust to preserve their benefits. But there's a catch. When you do a first party supplemental needs trust, in, in the event that person ultimately passes away, whatever's left in that trust goes to repay uh, government assistance into these like Medicaid. But Medicaid paid out, they're going to request be returned back to them as required by the law. A third party special needs trust doesn't have that requirement. If you set up a special needs trust for your beneficiary and then they use the money and ultimately they pass away, you can direct how you want the rest of the money to be distributed. So if you have other children that don't need the special needs trust, it can go to them at that point. A pooled special needs trust uh, is a trust that's designed to take advantage uh, of uh, a nonprofit managing the assets and administering the trust for a lot of different beneficiaries. Uh, so your money would be paid in uh, and there would be a, a, a separate account for the funds that you paid in. And then they pool all of the assets of all these different beneficiaries, they earn money and then make distributions on generally a pro rata basis. And this can be helpful if there's not a good family member uh, or close friend to manage the money for the disabled individual, uh, and there's not enough money being left to them to justify the expense of using a third party trustee like, like a bank to manage their funds. That's uh, so a pooled special needs trust can be beneficial in that circumstance. So with a special needs trust, you are preserving government assistance, and therefore the money that you leave your disabled child can be used to supplement their lifestyle. It can be used to pay for going out to dinner, going to the movies, participating in sports. Um, I draft in the, a lot of my trusts that if they wanna be part of uh, Special Olympics, then their trustee needs to use their inheritance to pay for their participation. You can direct that it's important for them to participate in, in family uh, social events. And so if they need to travel, go to a family reunion or some relatives, your trustees authorized to use the money to pay for that. And those are things that you really couldn't afford if you were just relying on the benefits themselves. So if you had to spend all the inheritance down and then go back to just having government assistance, it, it's it's very minimal funds that get paid out for that purpose, and they're not going to have that quality of life. Uh, so there's some some major mistakes that I've seen in my career uh, that people try to use to get around uh, the issues of disqualifying uh, a beneficiary. They could disinherit their child, not leave them anything in their estate plan. They could just say, "Okay, well, my other kids will take care of my child that has special needs." Uh, and there, there, there's some problems with that. Uh, so the first is disinheriting a child. Some people will recommend, okay, just don't leave anything with that child, uh, and then they'll keep the public benefits. But like I said, those public benefits provide minimal levels of help. They're not going to have the quality of life 
that they could have if you use a special needs trust to provide for them. Um, and, and if you have a special needs child, I'm sure you're aware that child depends on you more than the other children. Um, and that dependency continues after you pass. And so if you give all the money to the other kids who don't need the money as much, you're, you're creating a, a, a problem for your child with special needs. Uh, this is a very short-sighted plan. Uh, a lot of people will think, well, I'll just leave it to the other kids and they know to, to take care of their child. Uh, well, that, that's a problem as well. Uh, and, and so it may be walkable for a temporary solution, but it's really not a long-term solution to care for a disabled child. I mean, there's some major drawbacks to going this route. Uh, first, the siblings may not have the financial resources to take care of, of your disabled child. Uh, they may not have the emotional resources that come with care of a disabled child. Uh, the, the level of care that you would provide your child is, in most circumstances, going to be more than what their siblings are willing to offer us. Uh, I would do anything for my daughter, I'm assuming so. Uh, I don't know that I would do anything for my brother. There's limitations uh, to how far I would go there, personally speaking. There's major issues of leaving money to one of the disabled child's siblings. Because uh, if you do that, then the disabled, uh, the non-disabled child, your, your, your other child that's managing the money, it's legally their money. And so that's a huge problem if they go through a divorce. They go through a divorce and they have to split assets. Well, they are splitting what you intended to leave for your disabled child. Your disabled child is, is going to be hurt as a result. Uh, or if your uh, able-bodied child uh, has an event of liability, they, they're in a car wreck, they get sued for something, those resources are available to satisfy court judgments there. I mean, if they run into debt issues, they have to file for bankruptcy. But I can tell you from the bankruptcy experience I have, the, the bankruptcy trustee is not going to care that everybody intended that money to be used for the disabled child. It's legally titled under the name of the person that's filing for bankruptcy. The trustee will go after it uh, in, in a Chapter 7 filing. Uh, so there are some major disadvantages uh, to using uh, one of the able-bodied children to take care of a disabled child. Um, and then what happens if, if the child you put in charge dies or becomes incapacitated? Um, under this kind of situation, there's not a succession plan for who takes care of the assets for uh, your disabled child. And that's something that especially needs trust for the resolve. Now, there, there are privacy concerns. As I mentioned, the probate process is public. Uh, so if, if, if somebody were to find out that your child received you know, errors because you passed away, they can go into the court records and see what all they have. I mean, that could make your child a target um, for these predators to, to take the money from your children um, and steal it. And that, that's a scary proposition. Um, and that's, that's not something that's going to happen with a special needs trust. Another uh, major issue I see is choosing the wrong professionals uh, to do the plan. Uh, there are lots of attorneys out here that will say they do estate planning, but they don't have experience with special needs trusts. Uh, it's 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 a very niche area of estate planning. There's a lot of attorneys out there that will say they can do a state plan, and what they'll do is they'll they'll buy a template from the state bar for wills and power of attorney documents and say, okay, I can do your state plan. Well, if they are not a dedicated estate planner, they're not going to, to have the knowledge and understand the intricacies uh, of planning for a special needs individual. Uh, and then another problem I see is with online state planning. People will go to LegalZoom or Rocket Lawyer or whoever uh, and just download a will, fill it out, and, and say, okay, I've got my estate plan, and, and that was much cheaper. 
And well, your initial price is cheaper, but the cost is going to be significantly more using one of those online wills. Uh, I've reviewed a lot of those, and I've never seen an online will that had special needs planning in it. Um, it's just not there. And, and so if you have if you use one of those wills and you've got a special needs child and, and somebody comes to me after you pass away, the executor said, we need to probate this will, then we have to do a lot of work to get that will probated because they're often problematic. Uh, and then once it is probated, I'm going to have to file a separate application to reform the will to include the provisions it should have had. Uh, and that's that's a long process, and, and because it's a long process, it's an expensive process. And so it's much better to do the planning beforehand uh, and not wait until it's too late. That's that's what I have for a special needs trust today. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be quite a few questions on that. I'd, I'd love to field those now. The um. But um, well, you're. Why don't we do this? Um, let me. Um, well, we've got a lot of time left. That, that's all right. Let's go ahead and, and look at the Q and A in the chat. Here. Okay. Um, please, you guys. Um, we don't. Uh, we've got so many people on um, these webinars. We do not um, um, open the mics or, or, or call on people. If you would put any questions or um, that you have in the chat um, or the Q and A. Um, we will try to get to them and get them answered. We've got lots of time, so um, please okay. um, add any questions you guys might have. All right. The first question, uh, Nicole says, I'm assuming each state has specific rules and regulations for these type of trusts, correct? My parents are in California and I'm here in Texas. Good question. Yes, each state has their own rules for how um, special needs trusts operate. Um, there's a lot of similarities, but each state reserves the right to do something different. And California does things much different from Texas, as you can imagine. Uh, in California, it's especially important to use a trust to plan on the state, uh, because under the California probate code, if, if somebody doesn't have a trust, then the attorney that uh, does the probate uh, they charge on a percentage basis, a percentage of the assets that are in the state. Uh, and so those can be significant fees that are going to the attorney rather than going to the intended beneficiaries. Uh, so even if a special needs uh, situation wasn't part of that equation, I would say your parents really do need to go see a good estate planning attorney uh, to get a trust in place. Uh, but if there's an individual they want to provide for, uh, then they need to make sure uh, that has special needs and they need to have the special needs language in place. Um, one of the, the components that I, I think I forgot to put some slides in today, uh, since we've got a lot of time, we'll uh, I'll go ahead and talk about it now. Uh, there are special rules for qualified retirement accounts uh, for the taxation for a disabled beneficiary. Uh, so right now, for most beneficiaries, if you leave, name them uh, on your IRA or 401k, um, they have 10 years after you pass away to uh, take the distributions and pay the taxes. Uh, that was put in place with the SECURE Act uh, not that long ago. There is an exception for special needs individuals. They're allowed to stretch the distributions across their lifetime. That provides some significant benefits for them. Uh, one, they are uh, paying less income taxes. Um, if, if they're taking smaller distributions, there's less money that has to be paid in income tax. Uh, and then the second is if the money stays invested under that account, then it grows tax-free. I and mean, if you can stretch it longer than 10 years and go to life expectancy, that could be considerable growth for a beneficiary. Now, with these special needs individuals, you don't want to name them individually as a beneficiary because that's going to cause problems with their benefits. You want to use a special type of special needs trust. Um, it's going to fit the requirements for uh, 
being the, the, the named beneficiary. Um, a regular trust is not going to be a great option. You need to have special needs trust uh, that becomes irrevocable upon your passing because it has to be irrevocable for the lifetime stretch to take place. Uh, and I have a spreadsheet that would take me a while to find where it is and share it with y'all, but there's there's significant financial benefit of keeping that money invested for longer than 10 years. Okay. All right. Bernice would like to know, when you're talking about how property is dispersed without a will, are you talking about minor or adult children? Either. Uh, and, and there's obviously more complications with one versus the other. Um, when a married couple uh, has children from different uh, relationships and one of the, uh, the husband or wife passes away, uh, then their share of community property goes to their kids regardless of how old they are. They could be infants and then they'd be on the title to the house. And that creates a whole host of problems. One, the surviving spouse who's paying for the house is putting money into an asset that's going to go to this other child. And in some families, that's fine. Other families, that's, that's a big problem. Uh, and then if the house needs to be sold, an I mean, infant doesn't have signing ability. You have to be 18 to have a valid signature on legal documents. Uh, and so we end up having to do uh, a court-ordered guardianship uh, for the child in order to manage the assets that they receive. Uh, we did one of those recently where we had to get the court's permission to sell a piece of real estate that was co-owned by a 14-year-old that, that she inherited from her mother. Uh, and we had to get the title company to send the 14-year-old's share of proceeds to the court and the court's going to deposit it into a savings account that has minimal interest on it. Uh, and when that child's going to get that money outright when they turn 18. Um, and it's hard to tell how mature a 14 year old is going to be at 18. But I know there's not a lot of 18 year olds out there that would be mature enough to manage an inheritance like that. I mean, you go buy a car. Or, or throw for a uh, party for their friends and, and spend the money instead of it being used on something uh, beneficial like an education or, or trade school or something of that, uh, of that nature. Uh, and so when you do trust planning, you can define when an able-bodied child can have their inheritance outright, or you can have uh, the money held in trust and used for their benefit. There's a lot of different options you can use uh, that would make planning really important. Okay. The next question is from Myrna. Can a will be converted to a trust? So there is a type of trust that is contained within a will. Uh, so if you pass away and your will contains what we call a testamentary trust, that's a trust that gets established when the will is probated. Uh, it, it is not established until that point. So it doesn't do anything until it's been filed with the court and there's been a hearing on it uh, to get everything started. Uh, if you set up a revocable living trust, it's revocable because you can make changes to it. It's a living trust because you establish it while you're alive. Uh, and so you can, you can use it and get benefits from it before you even pass away. Now, if your question was in the context of you already have a will and you want to consider doing a trust, uh, absolutely, you, you can add a trust to your estate plan very easily. You want to go to a good estate planning attorney to help you with that. All right. The next question. Let's see. Okay. Um, what is the tip? And this is from Anonymous. Mm -hmm. What is the typical cost of setting up a special needs trust? It depends. Um, at our firm, it, it typically ranges between four thousand and eight thousand, depending on the options that you want. Uh, but I don't know that I can speak for all 
uh, law firms out there. And for clarification, in case we haven't said it already, I'm not here to sell services today. I'm, I'm here for educational purposes. Um, but that ballpark is what I've seen for fees. And it, and hearing those numbers, it's important to have some context. Going through probate with a will, you're paying for the will, and then you're also paying for the probate later. Uh, and right now, probate is between five thousand and seventy-five hundred. Uh, so while a trust will have a higher price up front, it ultimately costs you less. Okay. Next, from Jean, do special needs trusts need to be irrevocable? They need to become irrevocable um, after the person that creates it passes away or after uh, contributions are made uh, in excess of the threshold that you choose. And let me unpack that. Uh, so there, when doing a third party supplemental needs trust, there are the three ways that you can do that. You can do it within a will. It's not a great option because you're waiting for the probate court in order to have authority to manage the assets. You can do it through a revocable living trust that is set up for general estate planning purposes, uh, which you're using to provide for other beneficiaries as well. Uh, and, and that can be a good option uh, if you're trying to keep legal costs down. If it's all contained in one document, uh, it's a little bit cheaper to go that route. Um, and so in that type of trust, it would need to become irrevocable once the person passes away, uh, the person that made the trust. Now, it's often a good idea to do a, a standalone special needs trust that's separate from the regular trust that our, our family does because it offers some, some um, incentives for other people to provide money for that beneficiary. So if there are other family members that want to use their estate home to provide for your disabled child, then you can do a standalone trust that says the money that gets contributed is not your money, it's for the benefit of this disabled child. So uh, these other family members can have confidence that the money's going to be used how they want it to be used. Uh, and whenever I draft those standalone trusts, uh, I'll talk to clients about a minimum threshold if, if if X dollars are contributed by a third party, then it becomes irrevocable at that point. Uh, and that's important for, for two big reasons. One, if it's revocable, then the, the trust maker, the grant or set or whatever you want to call them, they can revoke the trust and take the money out and take it for themselves. But if it's irrevocable, they can't do that. So that, that gives the third party uh, contributor more confidence that it's gonna be actually used for the right purpose. Uh, and then also if if you're using uh, the qualified retirement account like a 401k or an IRA to contribute to that third party trust, it has to be irrevocable at the time the contribution is made for you to get the lifetime stretch on the distributions. If you name a revocable trust as the beneficiary uh, of, of a qualified retirement account, you're only going to get five years of stretch period. Uh, and there's significant difference in, in, in the numbers between those two options. Hey, an anonymous person asked, can you please restate the first type of trust you discussed before you got to the special needs trust? Revocable living trust uh, is what I would call it. Um, and so that, that's a trust for general estate planning needs that can have special needs trust built into them. Uh, and they're really great because they, they help manage your assets for you while you're alive, you become incapacitated, and then they provide a, a great framework for administration after you pass away without uh, any government or court involvement. Okay, Karen would like to know, do you have a questionnaire to use to be sure everything is covered when the special needs trust is created? Yes, yes. I, I've got a very comprehensive questionnaire that, that I use uh, to learn about what assets my client has. 
because uh, I, I don't want to make any assumptions. I want to make sure there's not an asset that is, is floating out there that disqualifies a beneficiary. That's extremely problematic and it can be expensive to fix. Okay, the next question um, is, so there is a separate trust for special needs child uh, separate from the other children. You, you can do it as a standalone document uh, that the other children are not named on the trust. Um, and we talked about some of the benefits there. Um, another benefit to going that route um, is the beneficiary of a trust uh, under Texas trust law has the right to see a copy of the trust and have an accounting of the assets that are in that trust. Uh, and so if you are wanting to provide more money for a disabled child than your other children, this can be a tool that you use to keep your other children from knowing how much more you're giving the disabled child. Um, that's a technique we use with special needs children that are getting disproportionate share, uh, or even not non-special needs kids. If, if a parent wants to provide more for that child and the other children not know about it, then using a separate trust can be a great tool for them. Okay, uh, the next question is, can you explain how child support works within a special needs trust? Yeah, um, child support while the parent is alive uh, goes to the parent that's taking care of the child. Uh, after that, after the surviving parent passes away as well, then the child support uh, is payable to uh, that child, it becomes their asset. Uh, and it would be important for a family law attorney that does divorces uh, to address that in the divorce decree that orders the child support uh, when that's set up. And you know you've got a special needs child and you've got a trust in place, it would be important to make sure those funds go to that trust and not to the child in the event both parents pass. Okay. Elise wants to know, I know that you mentioned that people will not will often not create a will or special needs trust because it costs too much. What dollar amount that a family possesses, just a general recommendation, do you think a family needs to establish an, a special needs trust? That's a good question. Um, as I mentioned on the benefits slides, it only takes more than $2,000 to disqualify a beneficiary from the benefits. So if you're planning on leaving more than $2,000 to a child, you, know, you need to do planning that has some degree uh, of special needs planning. Now, there are wills, and, and I've got wills that do this. If, if a will is all that fits a client's budget, and I'm happy to prepare a will for a client that has language for special needs planning, uh, that that will make sure they still get the benefits. It just forces us to go through probate whenever we use a will. Okay, what are the implications for establishing a special needs trust for someone over 65? There are, there are special rules uh, that come in play there. I've not had to do a third party trust for an over 65 beneficiary. Uh, so I've not looked at those rules uh, ever. I just know that they are different. So I apologize. I don't have a good answer to that question. Okay. But we could get her an answer. Yeah, I could find the answer yes. for sure. I, I just don't want to lie to you and, and act like uh, I know right. all of the, the uh, rules, especially each point. Okay. Elise wants to know, and you may have mentioned this, but what is the best way to stay out of probate? I hear that word a lot and do not fully understand how to avoid it. Okay. So assets pass after you pass away based on how the assets are owned. If you own something in your name, you pass away, then that asset becomes part of your probate estate. It's, it's kind of like a legal entity that comprises all the assets that you own, all the debts that you have. Um, and so if you own it individually, it goes through probate. 
uses a beneficiary designation or a right of survivorship. That's a separate contract that keeps it out of the probate estate and it goes to beneficiaries. And those do okay whenever uh, we're dealing with, with limited resources, but they they don't have a lot of contingency planning built into them. Uh, so like you name your disabled child as beneficiary on something, well, it'll avoid probate, but they now have assets that don't have special needs uh, provisions associated with them. So that's, that's a problem. Um, or even if you've got a child that was completely healthy whenever uh, you set up the account, but they were in an accident and they had brain damage and they became dependent on government assistance. If your beneficiary designation still goes to them, then that's going to cause a problem for, for their government assistance. Uh, and so the best option for avoiding the probate court process is to use a trust. That is an automatic process because what it is is it's a contract. It's a contract between you, the trust maker, and whoever is going to ultimately manage the assets. They're known as the trustee. And so since you've got that contract in place, it does not have to go through probate court. It can automatically uh, the trustee has for it. Um, and so that's that's what I recommend to avoid the probate court process. You, you know, can I ask you a question real quick, Austin? Sure. In, in analogy of your warehouse analogy that you talked about in the trust earlier, uh, could you describe the warehouse for for the trust as opposed to the warehouse going into probate? Okay, sure. Um, with, with a will, it's, it's like there's assets that are in a warehouse, but nobody has the keys to it. You're trying to get to the assets for, for the deceased person, but it's all locked up. You do not have the ability to access them until you get a key. So filing a will for probate is asking the court to give you a key that opens that warehouse up and there's delays and downsides of, of going through that process. With a trust, you have a key immediately. You don't have to go to any third parties to get a, a key made, you already have it. And this can be critical, especially for uh, planning for disabled children, because if they are dependent upon you on a monthly basis for financial support, you pass away and nobody has access to that money, that's a big problem for your child. If you have a trust, there's no delay. The very next day, I can get a trustee to have access and administer the assets the way you want it done. Court involvement, you know, having to pay the attorney to go to uh, the probate process, it's, it's a much better option. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Nicole has a, an interesting question. Her situation is that it's about her elderly mother. She has a disability and has inherited from her mother. The attorney who helped us or helped her mentioned that she may benefit from one of these special needs trusts. She qualifies for Medicaid, uh, Medi-Cal actually. I'm not sure how this would benefit her as an adult. How does it work? Now, this may be the same answer that you gave the other one. I don't know. Yeah, so when I say disabled child, um, that's not necessarily a minor child. You know, that, that, that could be a grown adult. There's a, a, a term with Social Security, disabled adult child, DAC is what you call it. Uh, and so if, if, if you've got an adult that is receiving those benefits and there's a special needs trust in place, then that will shield them from the disqualifying event of receiving those funds. Uh, now, Sheila said it was Medi-Cal, which tells me that might be in another state. It's California. Uh, yeah, California. Um, and I, I don't know all the details of how their system works. Medicaid is technically federal funding, but it's administered by each state with different rules. Uh, and I'm, I wouldn't even say I know all the rules in Texas, let alone in California. 
Well, and we're doing a Medicaid uh, next month. That's what our webinar is going to be on is Medicaid. And it is, but it is, and, and people, please hear what he just said. It is, it is a federal program because you have people argue with us every day about this. It is a federal program. Yes. But somehow the funds are administered state to state, which means there are different rules in each state and they vary differently or dramatically. Um, Texas to Florida, uh, it, 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 it varies dramatically. Texas to California there. And so it's just very different. Um, and what we're going to be talking about next month is Texas, because that's all we're licensed to talk about. But it is, um, it is, it is a federally funded program, which makes, it probably makes no sense to you, but it doesn't make a lot of sense to me either. But I'm telling you that that's how it works, that the states have the ability to administer it how they see fit. And so that's why it's different. The Medicaid uh, webinar is going to be presented by another attorney at our firm. Yes. Uh, there's another attorney that Medicaid is, is his niche, and that's what he knows really well. I do pre-planning to keep people eligible. He gets into the weeds of helping people apply if they need it and move assets around to get them eligible if they didn't do pre-planning. Yes. Okay, next question. How do distributions work for the Special Needs Trust? What can the money be spent on? That's a great question. Uh, whenever I draft a special needs trust, I include um, what I'll call a laundry list of, of specific things that the trustee can know for sure they're allowed to spend the money on. Uh, and I think having a detailed trust is important so that the trustee doesn't accidentally pay for something they're not supposed to. Uh, but generally speaking, they can pay for things, uh, they can pay for transportation, they can pay for medical expenses that are covered by Medicaid, uh, they can pay for um, entertainment. Um, there's a, a lot of different things that they can pay for that makes the disabled child's quality of life so much better than if they were just relying on the government assistance alone. Okay. An anonymous person wants to know, what is the cost to transfer a house or a vehicle to a living trust? Well, oh, okay. Uh, I generally don't recommend putting a vehicle on a living trust in Texas uh, because it's usually more housing than it's worth. You can transfer a car without having to go through the probate process. Uh, if a legal heir sign a document at the DMV, then they'll retitle the car and I think it's like $28 for them. Uh, the downside to putting a car in a trust is that will often create an increase in insurance premiums um, because at least in Texas, uh, your insurance premiums are calculated based on your driving record and your credit score. And if I were to draft a trust for you, it wouldn't have either of those. Uh, and so insurance companies will typically kick you up to the corporate insurance rate, which could be double what you pay. So it's just not worth putting a, a car in a trust. Uh, putting real estate into a trust, it's typically just uh, the cost of doing a deed and the filing fees uh, with the county. Uh, so at our firm, we charge 325 for that, uh, just standard every deed we do. Okay. Okay, Tima would like to know, do individuals that create a special needs trust have to notify all of the holders of their assets that there's a special needs trust created? meaning uh, 401k, uh, your 401k holder, bankers, et cetera? Great question. I want to return to my warehouse in the uh, The trust is like a warehouse. You've got keys to it. If you have a warehouse and you don't put anything inside of it, it doesn't do you a lot of good. Uh, it takes up space and, and it's not shielding anything. You have to put your assets inside of the trust for it to work. Uh, so with a regular revocable living trust, you move generally all of your assets into your trust with the exception of cars that we just talked about, and you can't move a qualified retirement account like a 401k into your trust when you the lot. That would rely upon beneficiary designations. Uh, and so if, if you set up a, a special needs trust, then you would name it as the beneficiary of that kind of account. 
Okay, if you have a disabled adult relative and they receive a small social security check, will an inheritance void any future social security payments? Will a special needs trust help that situation? Well, it, it depends on the social security. There's the regular social security that, that you get when you're retirement age, um, or at least hopefully you get some data when I'm money. Versus the supplemental income uh, that, that we're talking about. If they're on SSI or Medicaid, leaving them anything in excess of $2,000 is going to be a problem. If they're just getting regular Social Security, that, that's not true. Okay. okay. Jeannie says, I have a will that states that my 401k annuity, which I have not yet begun drawing from, will go to a special needs trust for my special needs son upon my death. But the special needs trust has not actually been drawn up. How would this work? Okay, let me unpack that. So the will cannot override any terms that are on the 401k. So if your beneficiary designation on the 401k is what's going to control what happens. So if you have them listed individually, but your will says it's done differently, it's going to them individually. And that's a problem. So it would need to name the testamentary supplemental needs trust established by your will as the beneficiary. Uh, and there's a, a technical way to do that. Uh, in my opinion, it's a better option to set up a trust while you're alive you already have the name and everything set up and you can use a uh, beneficiary designation. It's a little bit easier to make sure that it's going to the special needs trust for their benefit. Okay. Okay, what happens if the money in a special needs trust is spent on something it's not supposed to be spent on? So there's there's some different components to that uh if it's if it's spent on an expense that's not allowed that could create eligibility issues for uh, their benefits and that's one of the reasons i think it's important to do a full-blown revocable trust that has special needs provisions is it's going to give more detailed instructions to your trustee whereas if you just have a will that generally says if somebody's incapacitated, your executive manages them for them. It does not give them very good instructions for how to administer the money and use it to support this person. Uh, so it's important that they have good information to work off of, and, and then I incorporate that into my special needs trust that are established by somebody's alive. Okay. If the special needs adult child needs to go into a long-term care facility and has a special needs trust, will this affect them qualifying for nursing home Medicaid? It will not impact them, which is the beauty of the special needs trust. It's not considered a countable resource, and so they're eligible for that Medicaid. Okay. You know, one of the things that I think... Um, that I think can't be emphasized enough, and you've definitely emphasized it, is the fact that the problem that's created when when these people inherit money and they lose their benefits and, and they have to do spend down before they can re reapply for the benefits, and some of those benefits have waiting lists. And so you start all over. I mean, you can really... Um, just totally pull the carpet out of underneath somebody's care by by not planning appropriately. Okay. Um, should the beneficiary designation of retirement accounts be listed as a special needs trust for the benefit of child A with their percentage and directly to other children with their percentage? Now, that's it, a good one. it depends on what your estate plan looks like. I, I would have to review that. You know, there's there's a way that that would be correct. Um, I, I can't give you a legal opinion as to how to do that because I, I don't know enough information. Um, if, if you're in Texas and you'd like me to, to take a look at your documents, I'll be happy to do that. Okay. 
Let's see what all. Oh, wow. I've just been doing the Q&A. I did not. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, Probably good. My presentation was a little on the short side because there's a lot of questions. That's good. Okay. How, uh, you already did that. Okay. Um, great. Okay. Let's go back to this. Is there a difference between a revocable trust and a living trust to hold special needs trust in Texas? Uh, revocable and living are just different descriptions. Revocable means you can make changes to the trust. You can uh, revoke it and get rid of it if you wanted, wanted to. And living just means you set it up while you're alive. Uh, and so typically they're both revocable and living. You can do irrevocable and living. Uh, and those are helpful in certain circumstances to set it up at the very beginning to have it irrevocable. Uh, I use those a lot with asset protection planning. Okay, this is interesting. Olga says, we lived in California and generated a special needs trust for our son. We relocated to Texas and would like to know if we need to generate a new one in Texas. Also, our son is 36 years old. Short answer is yes, we do need to get that redone. The long answer to that question is there are Texas provisions in trusts that don't exist in other states that you really need to have. So if you leave primary residence to your child and they're living in that house and held by a California trust, it does not have homestead asset protection or tax exemption eligibility. So that house could be taken from your child or uh, and maybe in a less extreme circumstance, you're not going to get the tax break of having a homestead because it's in a California trust. We need to get that restated with Texas provisions to fix those issues. Marty, that's all I see. Do you see any more? I, I don't. I think you've covered everything, really. I think you really have. The um, one question um, I'll, I'll add to the um, to the last question is: If the child still, if the adult child still resides in California, and you reside in Texas, would that make a difference? Uh, it could. Um, but if you are currently living in Texas and you've got your house in the trust, then you're not going to get the tax exemption. So you'd probably want to restate that anyway. Great. Great. Very good. That's, um, if we could move to the, um, to the next slide and we're going to talk about the CEUs real quick. You guys have a, a couple more minutes. If you, if you have other questions to put them in the chat or the Q and A, I know we've covered a lot. But Sheila, I'll let you go ahead and talk about CEUs. Okay. Um, for those of you that need the CEU, and this is really cool too. I, I wanted to mention this. There's a couple of people on here who are providers, but they're also parents of special needs children. And I thought that was wonderful that they were on here. Anyway, um, if you need a, um, a CEU, um, please, that when you get the follow-up email, there's two things that I will need you to fill out, which is a, and you're very used to this, it is a sign-in sheet and an email form. Um, evaluate Austin's uh, presentation and uh, presentation skills, et cetera, and um, send that back to me. And also the cool thing, the cool thing on there is please take the time at the very bottom if you have anything you would like us to discuss in the near future, because we're planning three months out on these webinars, Marty has this, some, some suggestions that he gave us, which I think are excellent that I got yesterday. But if you have anything that you want to hear, even if we've covered it in the last six months or a year, please send it to me because then we're more than happy to do it again. I, you know, if you missed it or you need more, whatever, it can, it doesn't matter to us. We're here to educate you in any way that we can, because an educated public is better for all of us. So um, anyway, and send those back to me and I will send you your certificate. Thank you. 
great. And once again, thank you. We certainly appreciate you all, not only for partnering with us all, but also um, Heyman Hogue provides the CEUs um, um, for these webinars, which um, includes more of the licensing than we're set up to do. So we certainly appreciate you doing that. And as I said earlier, that's a, a fairly tedious task dealing with all those certificates and that kind of thing when we're talking about um, 140, 150 people that are on. Um, in addition to the um, to the the two sheets that Sheila would like, will will we need you to finish uh, and get back to her in order to get CEUs. And um, we're also asking you to complete the Google survey. You should have an option to go to that as you close out of Zoom today. Um, that helps us um, uh, collect information to report back on our goals as goals and objectives that we set forth when we applied for the funding to do these webinars. So we should, certainly would appreciate your help with that. Uh, could we advance the slide one more time, Austin, if we could? Um, we're set up next month to do Medicaid. I think that um, in light of the conversation we had, I'm gonna add Texas to the title of this. Yes. And we're gonna yeah. say Texas Medicaid to, um, 2023 um, because um, the Medi-Cal, I, I, I get the, um, the, um, that I, I'm from California and, and have a lot of family there and realize there is a huge difference. And, and so the, the administration by the state is, is a very important factor. So I will add Texas to the title um, as I send that out, but you'll see um, a link to the flyer uh, for this in the follow-up email as well, as long as along with other um, webinars that we have coming up. Um, did any, anything else show up, Sheila? Well, we were well. Two people ask if we can provide CLEs, which is for attorneys. We have done those before, but it would you. It has to be a case by case basis. I, it, correct me if I'm wrong, Austin, but we would have had to have applied for this for CLE with so, attorney group, right? Yeah, you have to get pre approval for it to count. So if if in the future, if that's a, okay, Thelma, see, she sees this. If in the future um, we find several attorneys are needing those, we can do that because uh, one of our attorneys uh, did that and we did that for, I don't even remember the subject. Austin, do you remember what it was? I don't. I don't. It, but anyway, we've only done one like that so far, but we can do that because we have now the the um the channels to get that done and and just as an aside <laughs> we're about to be uh, licensed to give uh realtors credit as well nice. so now i know that may not be interested to a lot of people on here but uh the tre we've already trek we've already sent our thing in with our money and our our all of this in there so um yeah, should be able to do that. And where the realtors would be interested is probate. Yeah. Because it, for a realtors and title company people, we get questions all the time about probate. But if you trust too. I mean, I'm well, estate, yeah. uh, estate planning and trust, um, all of that, uh, you know, falls into that. It, it, that's great stuff. But but the attorneys, I, I do know that we have, I, I know we have at least four attorneys on here today because I had to send them all links. I mean, those are the ones that, the people that were having trouble logging in. So I know there's several attorneys on here. Oh, um, okay. Um, uh, just, just so you know, um, I could go through um, through email addresses and figure out some as well, but just by the email addresses or by the signature on the, on the emails I got about trouble they were having, um, I know there's at least four on here. Um, well, Austin, maybe we can put that on our agenda to check and, and do that for next time. I'm sorry, Marty. I didn't we no. didn't I didn't know that this would be a big thing. I know that we've had occasionally you'll have one ask that. So, but yeah. Yeah, I, I mean we're that's happy just... to do it now that that it, we just have to get back with that channel and figure out I don't know how the timing works. You know, yeah. if, if yeah. they can, if we can get it fast enough for next time, I don't know this. It, so. it, it's 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 not a problem whatsoever. And, and and I wouldn't have even thought of it um, until somebody asked today because we've had we've done lots of these and no one's asked before. And so if someone had asked before, we would have looked into it before. But I do know every one of these we have attorneys on. I know um, Legal Aid in Northwest Texas has a, a, a fair number of their people that join us for for the legal you know the legal ones we do. And so um, that would be um, great if you awesome. could. If you could, it's surely understandable. Um, <clears throat> 
Thank you, Austin. Thank you so much. It was really Ooh. very, very informative, great stuff. And Sheila, thank you for your help in getting these organized. Um, once again, we'll be talking about Texas Medicaid for 2023 um, next month on the 18th. Um, please help us spread the word and um, and um, try to get it, get the information, the links out to as many people as possible. You know, we do these to try to help as many people as possible. And so those numbers just help everybody. Um, we'll get that out to you in the, in the follow-up email. Sheila, um, we'll, once I get the documents, we'll have those out to you. And um, thank you all for joining us. And it will not be a short one next month because Medicaid is a very confusing, confusing oh. topic. So yeah. you can do this and this unless this and this and if that, you know, and it's no. So believe me, it'll be, it'll take the whole time next time. So. That's great. Anyway. That's great. Well, thank you all for joining us. I hope you all have a wonderful day. And, yes. and once cool. again, Austin and Sheila, we sure appreciate it.